So today we're going to start to talk about uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Um, so you know, so far we've been talking about our multiple linear regression model. So, so we talk about the uh, multiple linear regression model and the emphasis so far has been on the um, estimation of the mean for our uh, dependent variable. Yeah, you know, so at some point we also talk about the variance. Um, you know, when we talk about the generalized least square regression model, uh, especially in the context of um, cross-sectional data. So, you know, but, you know, the, the, the main objective so far has been just the estimation of the mean of the dependent variable. Now, when we talk about maximum likelihood estimation, as you will see, the emphasis is going to be in the estimation of the overall uh, distribution of, of, of a variable. So, and that's kind of, I mean, the way that you can be thinking about, um, you know, these two different approaches to estimation. So, you know, when we're talking about, you know, least square estimation, again, the main emphasis was on the mean. But now that we talk about maximum likelihood estimation, the way to think about it now, we're interested in the entire distribution of, of, of a variable, not only the mean. So, and that's kind of the way that you can connect uh, both things. So, since the um, main objective, as you will see, of maximum likelihood estimation tends to be the estimation on the entire distribution, you know, we need the starting point is the probability density function of and we're going to say a random variable y. Okay, now, before, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, linear regression model, we were talking about um, the mean, the distribution, as a function of a set of explanatory variables. Um, to start with, uh, you know, our, our, our work for maximum likelihood estimation, you know, we're going to be talking about um, an, a distribution that is not conditional on, on other variables, okay? It's just going to be conditional on, 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 on a vector of, of, of parameters. So we start with distribution, this probability density function of a random variable conditioned on a vector of parameters, theta. So later on, we will see how actually this vector of parameters can be made a function of explanatory variables. But for now, we're going to ignore these explanatory variables. So we have this probability density function, condition on a, a vector of parameters. Now, the joint density, if, if we have n observations from this probability density function, and these observations happen to be independent, so this is the joint density of n ID observations, that means that they are independent, identically distributed since they come from the same process, from the same probability function, is the product of the individual densities. So the joint density. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to be denoted the um, probability density function for a specific observation y. I'm going to be denoting it as f y. Okay, so now I have that index that denotes the probability density function of a specific or the probability density function evaluated at a specific observation uh, i. So that's that index. But now what we need is the joint density okay, for all of these um, observations that come from, from, from this process. So we have y1, y2, yn, conditional and theta. So that's going to be equal to the product okay, of the individual densities. Observation, so that's a product from 1 to n, 
and we call L. So that's called a likelihood function. So this probably is the not as likelihood function. And we change the order. So before we have the joint density of y as a function of um, you know this parameter um, theta. But later on, you know, for estimation, we'll see that what we're interested is in, uh, you know, we don't know this parameter theta. So based on, on, on observed values of y, we're going to be estimating it. So that's kind of we change the order of the variables. So this joint density is what's called the likelihood function. Okay. Now, for purposes of estimation, we'll see later on, you know, the main objective um, and kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be um, moving ahead. So what we're going to be interested is in estimating this parameter uh, theta here as a function of this, this variable. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to try to find the parameter vector theta that maximizes this likelihood, uh, you know, function. Now, since here we have this product of functions, you know, the maximization of that function is a little bit complicated. So it's going to be easier to work with the log of, of, of the likelihood function. So the natural log of the likelihood function is going to be equal to the sum of the natural log of you know, that density function evaluated for each individual yi. Okay, so how do we do to that? Remember that, you know, the, the, the log of a product is equal to the sum of the logs of each of the components of that product. And that's what we have here. So this is called the log likelihood function. Okay, so let's look at an example. So let's assume that, you know, in kind of like a context, we have data on crop yields, and we want to estimate the distribution of yields. And so why do we are interested in estimating the entire distribution of yields? Well, that's useful for the calculation of probabilities of yield losses, which is required for the estimation of crop insurance premiums. So if we have data on n observations for yields, and assume that the yields are uh, normally distributed, so we we'll assume that the yields follow a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square. So the function. So notice here that before, I mean, what we call theta now is 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 a vector of parameters. We have the mean and the variance for that distribution. And remember the probability density function the normal probability density function is given by this function y divided by the square root of 2 pi sigma square times x. So remember x is e, this is the constant e, to whatever value we have there. So that's what we call x, which is minus 1 half y minus mu square divided by sigma square. So remember, this is a function. And the coefficients defining the function are mu, which define the mean, and sigma square, which define the variance, and y is the specific value that takes, um, you know, the variable. And this is the, the, the density function. Um, and remember, intuitively, the density function uh, contains information about the probability of a, of a variable taking a specific value. So that's kind of the information that is contained in this density function. Okay, so let's use this as an example. So let's go back. So remember, we have a probability density function. In this case, we're saying that this is for yields. This is the function. So now let's write the likelihood function for this example. Remember that the likelihood function is theta as a function of the of the variables, of the values of the variable. And we say that's equal to the product of the um, uh, product of the individual densities, you know, for 
for um, you know the observations for y. Theta. One to n, and remember that in our specific case, this theta refers to the mu, to the mean, and the variance. Okay, now we just plug in here what is f of y, we just have this one over. Just give me a second. What happened here? I click something. Ah. <clears throat> I don't know what I ah, let me see. Should be this one. Uh, why did I click? Um, so I had some technical difficulties. I had to close and open the game, so we're saying, and I already wrote that, that uh, the likelihood function is the product of the uh, probability density functions for the individual observations. In our case, that theta includes mu and sigma square, and we just have to plug in here you know, the function, since we're having the normal distribution, should have 1 over 2 pi sigma square, square root, times exp minus 1 half yi minus mu square over, again, I click something, Let's see if I do a tablet model month. I hope that doesn't happen. Okay, so this is the likelihood function for our specific example. So have in mind that this is just an example. Different uh, probability density functions that are assumed for a specific process. You know, like in the case of the normal distribution, we could, for example, assume like some sort of gamma distribution, beta distribution if we believe that the distribution, for example, is not symmetric, or log normal distribution, we could be using that, so that the log like the likelihood function is gonna be different. Once we have the likelihood function, we can also write the log likelihood function. So the log likelihood function for this specific example, and again, make sure that you understand the process to do these things, which is very standard. So the log likelihood is always going to be the sum of the natural log of the probability density function evaluated at the specific values of the observations. Okay, so here I'm going to write, <coughs> this is going to be equal to, in this case, the result. I'm going to write the result and then I show you the derivation. 1 to n is going to be the natural log of 2 pi plus the natural log of sigma square plus yi minus mu square over sigma square. Okay, so how is that we got to that one? So, okay, so let's explain that. So, what we need is the natural log of yi conditional of mu and sigma square, which is going to be equal to the natural log, and then remember that's kind of what we wrote before. So that is normal probability density function. Yi minus 
minus mu square over sigma square. So that's what we have. Okay, so let's see how do we go about taking the log for that um, normal probability density function. So to make things easier, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be rewriting this. So remember that we can rewrite that as instead of having the square root, that to the minus uh, one half. And we're going to leave the second part as it is. And this is just taking logs. So this is the log of the product. So what are we going to be doing? The log of a product is the sum of the logs. And the natural log of x should be plus minus one half yi minus mu square over sigma square. Okay. And then, you know, the natural log of this expression, we can take the minus one half out, and that's going to be the log of two pi plus the natural log of sigma square. And then the log of dx is going to be whatever is inside. Be minus one half yi minus mu square divided by sigma square. Okay, so that's kind of the way that we have we obtain that expression, um, you know, uh, the expression above. And remember that we had is the sum. So this is the log of f y i, and here we have the sum, the sum for all y i's. Okay, so make sure that you understand the process. And more than memorizing it, how to do it this for the normal distribution it's important that you understand the process. I mean, you know, yes, this requires certain form of simplification, but you should be able to do this process for any uh, probability density function. Now, I know that I was trying to um, kind of, you know, how this thing is. So now we have this normal distribution and we're only talking about the mean and the variance. And um, how is that this is related to our regression model? Well, you know, we can make the mean a function of the explanatory variables, and basically we will have a regression model. So what I'm saying is that we can assume that that mu, so that's kind of like a conditional distribution, it's going to be exact prime beta. So now the mean is going to be a function of the explanatory variable, and we go back to basically our linear regression model. Especially if we assume... Um, homoscedasticity, so the sigma square is a constant, and, you know, we could estimate the beta, which is kind of what we were doing. We were estimating a, a, a linear regression model, like the one that I wrote at, at the beginning. Um, so, of course, you know, these results in the linear regression model, assuming that the errors are independently and, and identically, independent and identically normally distributed. Okay? So that's kind of what that what we have. Now, <clears throat> so, and I already mentioned this before, so kind of, you know, the next step would be, you know, once we have this log likelihood function, remember, we will have observations in y, like for in the case of the crop yields, we'll have observations in y. And then we would want to estimate that mu and sigma square coefficient. I mean, those are the unknowns. And I was telling you that you know, the way to do that is we will have to find the uh, values of theta that maximizes that, that function. So that would be like a, you know, a, an optimization process. So once we obtain those, we will get theta hat MLE. Okay. And this, again, in this context, this is going to be the MLE, the estimate MLE for the mean, and also the estimate MLE for the variance. And I'm going to write here who, who, what are those functions. And later on, we'll go back and actually I'll show you how do you go about doing this thing. 
And actually the result is very intuitive. So the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean for mu happens to be just the average for y. And the maximum likelihood estimate for the variance uh, is just you know the sum of deviation squares from y divided by n which is slightly different than the formula that we have for, for the variance of, of a variable, which is divided by n minus 1. So I'll show you later on how, 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 how is that the proof for that. But for now, let's see, you know, once we obtain those, uh, you know, once we obtain the, the estimator and those, those estimates, let's see what are the properties of, uh, you know, maximum likelihood estimators. So remember, and theta here is going to be the maximum likelihood estimator, the MLE of theta. So the first property is going to be consistency. So we write at the probability limit um, of theta hat, the MLE is equal to theta. So remember, and basically consistent means that as the large sample uh, goes to infinity, the distribution of this estimator gets closer and closer to the true population value. Um, asymptotic normality, that basically means that sigma hat um, is asymptotically, follows a normal distribution with mean sigma, and the variance is going to be given by the inverse of what's called the information matrix. So that's called information matrix. Uh, let me write it well. So this is called the information matrix. And in terms of uh, theory, so this information matrix is given by the negative of the expected value. So that's going to be the second derivative of the log likelihood function. Uh, let me see. The second derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to that data. Okay? So... Consistency, asymptotic normality, and this asymptotic normality is important because that's kind of what is going to allow us to um, do um, perform inference. Because one way to think about it, you know, this is the variance covariance matrix of the parameter estimate. So that's kind of we're going to be using this as the basis to calculate the variance covariance matrix of the par parameter estimates. Um, kind of what I mean that, and, and we've done this previously. So this is the variance covariance matrix of this, of this, of, of, of the parameter, of the parameters of this estimator, and again, which we will use for the variance covariance matrix of the uh, parameter vector of estimates. Asymptotic efficiency. Well, you know the MLE estimator is asymptotically efficient and achieves this kramer rao lower bound for consistent estimators, which defines the lowest variance among estimators that are consistent and asymptotically normal. So this is kind of, uh, you know, defines um, this efficiency property. So remember, the concept of efficiency is relative to other type of estimators. So here, the type of estimators that... Uh, um, MLE are compared to are any estimators that are both consistent and asymptotically normal. Okay, so this has this property of asymptotic efficiency. So we have consistency, asymptotic normality, asymptotic efficiency. The other property is what's called invariance, which basically means that the maximum likelihood um, estimator of a function gamma, so gamma is a function C of the coefficients, and that's basically the function evaluated at maximum likelihood estimators of theta. If this function is a continuous and continuously differentiable function, so you know this function needs to satisfy uh, you know, uh, certain uh, properties 
of continuity and also they need to be differentiable. So in practice, what does this mean? And I don't know this invariance name make it sound difficult, but in practice, what that means is that if you need the maximum likelihood estimator of a function of theta, you just evaluate the function If you evaluate the function at the MLE of theta, that's what you do. So, for example, okay, so in our case, so let's say that we're interested in estimating. So here, you know, we're assuming that the um, parameter, uh, the, the sigma square is the parameter that we're um, estimating. Um, so let's say that we're interested in estimating the square root of that. So to calculate the MLE of sigma, so that's just going to be the square root of sigma square over MLE. Okay, so it's very straightforward. If you need the maximum likelihood estimator of a function of theta, you just evaluate the function at the maximum likelihood estimator of theta. So it's very, very straightforward. And this property, you know, uh, comes from handy uh, um, all the time. Like, you know, if you are interested in estimating elasticities, so the maximum likelihood estimator of the elasticities are going to be the elasticities evaluated at the maximum likelihood estimator of the coefficients of your linear regression model. That should be like a, a, an application. Okay, so now let's talk about... Um, so you know, we haven't talked about how we are finding that theta. So finding theta hat, finding that you know, MLE. So the necessary condition for maximizing the uh, likelihood function it's just going to be the derivative of the log likelihood function theta with respect to theta. So remember, this is from calculus, is equal to zero. So that is the necessary condition. And then what we do is we solve for theta. Okay, now, so. You know, given that the log likelihood function, remember the log likelihood function is equal to the sum of uh, the logs of the PDF for the individual observations. The condition, so you, know, you see that necessary condition can be rewritten, so and this is called J. Remember, that's the derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to theta. It's the same as the sum of the derivatives of uh, those logs of the PDF for the individual observations with respect to theta. And of course, I mean that this is relatively too easy to calculate because now, so remember, um, the derivative of the log of the log likelihood function is going to be equal to the sum of the derivatives of the log of these PDFs with respect to theta. And sometimes it's called the sum of the GIs. We call each of those terms, and that's going to be equal to zero. So sometimes this G that the first derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to theta, sometimes called the Jacobian matrix. And I'm sure that you have seen this in, um, in other classes. So this is also called the score vector. 
you have calculus with uh, for matrices okay because remember this theta is a vector so that's kind of what's called Jacobian matrix but of course I mean you, know, you can have only one coefficient and that's not necessarily a vector so let's continue with our example so let's see how we apply these formulas in the context of our specific example again this is just an example make sure that you understand the process for any distribution so remember we have the log likelihood function and I'm going to use tilde so that's the not that vector of coefficients so we wrote this before we know that that log likelihood function is minus one half the sum from one to n the natural log of two pi plus the natural log of sigma square plus yi minus mu square over sigma square okay so g in this case since theta is a vector so we're going to have the derivative of the natural log the derivative of the uh, log likelihood function with respect to mu and also the derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to sigma squared so here I want you to remind me that here again theta because this can be a little bit confusing you see, theta square is kind of what we, it's, it's the parameter that we're interested. So if you want to think about that, that's theta 1, this is theta 2. Okay, so we're not interested in just, uh, uh, sorry, sigma. Sigma square is the coefficient that we're interested in estimating, not sigma. Okay, so and this is important because later on when we take derivative, things can get a little bit confusing if you don't remember that the coefficient of interest is sigma squared, not just sigma. So, <clears throat> if we would take the derivative of that log likelihood function with respect to mu, so it should be minus one half, that's a constant, times the sum. So there is no the term mu here, there is no the term mu here, and we have the term uh, mu here. So that should be plus, um, well, let me see, so we have what's inside, so let's start, so it's going to be 2 times yi minus mu, okay, and this is a constant sigma square, and notice that then we have to take the derivative of minus mu with respect to mu, and that will give us a negative sign. Okay, and now we're in the denominator, it will be again minus one half. So we have the sum of one to n. And then we have the derivative of log of sigma square with respect to sigma square. So that's one over sigma square. And then we have okay, so this this uh, here you have to be uh, a little bit careful, okay? Because this is the way to 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 think about it, and I'm gonna kind of digress here for a second so that you see, because this is important later on. I might I might move a little bit faster. Um, let me see. Let me, or maybe. Let me see, so let me digress here for a second. Okay, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the derivative of yi minus mu square respect to sigma square. Oh. I'm going to need more space. Okay, I'm going to write it above. So what we're trying to do here below is we are trying to take the derivative of yi minus mu square over sigma square with respect to sigma square. 
So to do that, you know, to make that easy, remember that we can write this as yi minus mu square times y2. And again, I ran out of space. Okay. But I think I'm going to simplify things. The point here is that this expression here, the way I'm going to write it, you can write it as y minus mu squared times sigma squared, because that's kind of the coefficient that are interesting to the minus 1. And that's what is in the denominator. So if we want to take the derivative of this thing with respect to sigma squared, so that's going to be equal to yi minus mu squared times sigma squared. Oops. To the um, so it's going to be minus because it's minus one, so minus sigma square. To the um, it should be minus one minus one. It should be to the minus. So let me see. Sigma square to the minus one. Uh, see here around a space. So again, let's go back. So the derivative of sigma squared to the minus one. So it's gonna be minus one sigma squared, and then you will have minus one minus one. So it's gonna be this thing to the minus two. Okay, so that's the, the answer. So when we write here, we will have minus one half, and then minus yi minus mu square and that's going to be divided by sigma to the 4 because we have square square okay and that has to be equal to 0 to be able to find an uh, uh, mu and uh, sigma square that maximizes the function. Okay, so make sure that you understand this process. I mean, it's kind of a little bit tricky. This is correct. Okay, so of course, I mean, to find the maximum, then you know, these two terms we, we make them equal to zero. So let's start with the first one. So we have minus one half. times i to the 1n minus 2 yi minus mu over sigma square equal to 0. So what we can do is we can take that 2 out and also that sigma square out. So if we do that, we end up with just 1 sigma square times the sum of yi minus mu equal to 0. Okay, so that sigma square multiplied times 0 is equal to 0. And so we can simplify things. So the sum of yi is going to be equal to n mu. And then if we solve for mu here, at mle is just going to be equal to the sum of yi over n which is equal to the mean of y. And that's the way that we find the maximum likely estimate for the mu. So let me see, let's make the other one that determine the denominator also equal to zero. And so we start with one over sigma to the four. So, <coughs> What I'm going to be doing here is, okay, but let me write down everything. And I'll go step by step instead of moving it too fast, just minus one half, sum of y to the n, one over sigma square minus yi minus mu 
square over sigma to the 4 and that's equal to 0 so I'm going to continue here so what we're going to be, do be doing here is let's um, you know we have two terms so let's separate those two terms Let's separate those two terms. So let me see. So we're going to have minus one half Let me see if everything's correct here. Yes, yeah, so we're going to have minus one half. So the sum of one over sigma squared is the same as n over sigma squared since you know we're repeating all of those terms so that's that first term and the second term we're going to have plus one half the sum of yi minus mu square over sigma to the four and that's equal to zero so what we can do now is that we can simplify that um, one half and also we can simplify this one so this is gonna in both sides so what we end up with is that's equal to minus n e let me see so again let me go step by step so what we have is the sum of yi minus mu square divided by sigma square. We move that to the other side. So that's going to be equal to n. And with that, we can solve for sigma square. So sigma square, I'm going to see MLE hat. So that's going to be equal to that sum of yi minus mu square. Oops. Divide by n, and of course, I mean we, we need to substitute the the estimate for mu to be able to calculate sigma square hat m l e. This is going to be equal to y i minus m l e hat square, which is happens to be the average value of y divided by n divided by n and that's kind of like the way that we you know find our maximum likelihood estimators for the mean of the variance of the normal distribution so as you can see both the mean and the variance of uh, the normal distribution are a function of the observed values of y Okay, so um, again, so here the idea is hopefully you know, I'm using this example. So this is an illustration, but you know you should be able to understand the process and be able to find the likelihood function, the log likelihood function, and then the um, you know maximum likelihood estimators for the coefficients of any 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 probability uh, distribution. Okay, so now let's talk about inference. And let's see how we are in terms of time. Let's see how we're doing. Okay, so for four minutes, I think we're fine. So let's let's continue. Um, now let's talk about the inference. Hi, this one. Uh, continue so let's talk about the inference okay so remember as before I mean we have that um, the asymptotic normality property for the estimators we say that are asymptotically normal with mean equal to the true parameters and the variance was given by this um, the inverse of the information matrix 
okay and we already defined that the inverse of that information matrix is going to be minus the expected value of the second derivative of the log likelihood function to theta so and this is the inverse okay and that's kind of what's the basis for inverse so there are three options for the calculation of the variance covariance matrix of theta hat remember so this is for our estimator but that's what we use for for our estimate so the first thing is we just replace theta hat for theta and that you know the inverse of the information matrix so notice here that um, you know the information matrix is the negative of the expected value of the second order derivative of the likelihood function with respect to theta but evaluated at the estimated theta height so what we're doing what we're doing here is that you know you have to go find this expression find that derivative and plug in there the values the values of the sigma uh, of the uh, theta values that you have uh, obtained okay so that's what we do there the second option is that instead of using inverse evaluated at theta hat what we're going to be using is an estimate of that inverse Okay, and we'll calculate the inverse of that matrix. And that estimate is just that second derivative. Okay, we do not calculate the expected value. Okay, and they look very similar, but you know there is a difference. Here, what we do is we take the derivative and then we calculate the expected value, and then we get a certain expression. Here we just take the derivative and then we plug in there the values that we estimate. Okay, so here again use the actual, not the expected uh, value of the second order derivative of the log likelihood function evaluated at theta. Okay, and third one is what's called E hat hat. To differentiate it from the previous one and that's going to be given by the products of those uh, Jacobian the individual terms for the Jacobian for uh, uh, each individual uh, uh, derivative for the density function of each observation so gi here is going to be the derivative of the log likelihood function evaluated at uh, individual observation i at theta hat with respect to theta. Okay, now this is the sum of the products of the first derivative of the log likelihood function. Okay, and that's for each observation. I should argue for each observation. Okay, so there's a log likelihood function for, you know, for each observation. And then this, this product is always non-negative definite, and you know sometimes this is called the you know BHHH estimator or the other product of the of the gradients. Okay, and I'll show you now. I think that's easier to see better when, with, with a specific example. You will see how these three options can be calculated in practice. Um, comments in large samples are equivalent. In small samples, option two seems to perform better, but the question is if, if it works. And this is the problem. So if you, sometimes, you know, it's hard. Um, you know, you might not be able to find the inverse of these matrices calculated this way, you know, with option number one and option number two. Two. However, this matrix is always going to be non-negative definite, so it's always going to be possible to calculate the inverse of, of, 
of, of this version. So this is in practice. I mean, this is the one that tends to work better. If you ever have to calculate, uh, you know, do these things from scratch when you are uh, implementing a maximum likelihood estimator. Okay, so let me see. I'm going to show you. So let's see how that works in the context of our specific example. Okay, so, you know, let's see the calculation of, of uh, this information matrix. And let's look at the three options. So we, we had already calculated this. So remember, uh, this is the Jacobian matrix. We have the, the derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to mu. We already did that. And with respect to sigma square, um, you know, we already did that. Remember, uh, I mean, that's kind of what we did here. So we had that. I think I kind of rewrote it a slightly different way, but it's the same thing. So here, what we need to do is we need to take the second derivative of um, the log likelihood function with respect to theta. So in the way that to go about doing that, I mean, what we do is we'll take the derivative. Remember, it's the second derivative. So this is the first derivative. Um, so this matrix we have here, um, uh, so this matrix are, it's, two, it's two by one. Okay. So now, since this is 2 by 1, now we're going to have 2 by 2. Because now what we're going to have is we're going to be taking the derivative of this expression with respect of, of, of the first term with respect to mu first, and then the derivative of this first term with respect to sigma square. And then for the second term in the Jacobian matrix, in the second row, we'll be taking the derivative with respect to mu first, and then we'll be taking the, rest, the derivative with respect to sigma square. Okay, so <clears throat> we're doing that. So let's to see just for you to, to follow. So let's take the derivative of this term with respect to mu again to find this term. And of course, if you do that, so um, what you are going to have is with respect to mu. So if you were to take this derivative, minus mu over sigma square. So this is derivative with respect to mu. So notice that the derivatives with respect to yi are equal to 0. And all the derivatives with respect to minus mu are going to be minus 1. But you have n of those derivatives. So you end up with minus n. And that sigma square is a constant. So and that's the way that you end up with this term here. Okay, and so for the second term, again, we have to take the derivative of this first term with respect to sigma square. And then again, so the sum of yi minus mu, it would be like um, considered as a constant. And then we would have to take the derivative of, you know, sigma square with respect to uh, Again, so here the trick is that you have to take the derivative with respect to sigma squared to the minus 1. So it's going to be minus 1 times sigma squared to the minus 2. And that's kind of what, how you end up with the second term. Okay, But make sure that you know how to, how to do all these operations, you know, and so on and so forth, so that we can end up with this. Uh, uh, so this is called the Hessian matrix. So this is the matrix of, of second derivatives. So, I mean, it's a lot of algebra involved. And now, <clears throat> so remember, for the first option, what we do is we need to take the expected value of these matrix of second derivatives. If we do that, then what we're going to end up with is n over sigma square. Um, so this of diagonal m becomes 0. And notice here, this is a, a symmetric matrix. So um, these two terms are going to be the same. OK, so let me see how, how that, that works. So let's take um, this term here on the top. 
So the minus the sum of yi minus mu divided by sigma squared, and let's take the expected value of that one. So if we do that, so remember expectations, so the expected value of a sum is equal to the sum of the expectations, so it's going to be 1 over sigma uh, 4, so these are parameters, so you know, uh, you can take them out, and then the sum of the expected values of that sum. And then here, you know, in each individual term, you have the sum. So again, is the sum of the expected value yi minus mu. Remember that the average of yi is mu. So basically, the sum of these differences is equal to zero. And that's kind of why this term came up to be zero. Okay? So, of course, you know, for the expectation of this first term, n over sigma squared, the expectations of that term is going to be n over sigma squared because both are constants. We say that that is equal to zero. These two are the same, so they are both equal to zero. And for this term, if you would calculate the expectations of this one, we're going to have the expected value of n over 2 sigma squared is going to be the same thing. So what we need to be concerned about what is the expected value of this sum of yi minus mu squared divided by sigma to the 6. And that's what we have here. So the expected value of that, uh, we can take that sigma to the 6 out since it's a constant, and then that's the sum of the expected value of yi minus mu squared. And um, so remember that, this, that um, the expected value of yi minus mu is just sigma squared because that happens to be the variance. And we have n of these sums. Since it's the same for each yi, so we have 1 over sigma to the 6 n sigma squared, so that gives us n over sigma to the 4, so it's like 2 over 2. And here on the top we had, so remember we have here 2 over 2 minus 1 half, so that gives us minus n over 2 sigma squared. Okay, so that's the expected value. And now, so remember, for, for use, for estimation of the variance covariant metric, so what we do, in, for option one, we just plug in the values. So is the information matrix evaluated at sigma hat, so we plug in those values, and that's kind of what we obtain. For option number two, remember what we do is we just take the derivative, which we already did here, and we just evaluate it. So we plug in there directly without having to take expectations, the MLE estimates. So our option number two, that's what we just did. We plug in those values. And for option number three, um, so remember previously we had calculated the um, Jacobian. That's what we started with. So that's the Jacobian, but now remember what we need is the Jacobian for each of the observations. So instead of having the sums, we're going to have the individuals, and the sum has to be taken out. So it's going to be the sum of these products of these Jacobians for each individual observation. Okay, so all of this is just you know, algebra. So make sure that you understand I mean, how this process works. For this specific example, but more importantly, make sure that you understand conceptually. Now, in practice, when um, you know you use a software, make sure that what is also the you know what type of uh, variance covariant matrix is being estimated. And because sometimes you know you use a software and you get one result, you need another software and you need another result. So what has been found is sometimes different software use like some of these different options. So and then your results might change depending on which option you are using. So you need to be aware of the existence of these different options for the variance covariance matrix. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we talk about the inferences, these different options. We have that example. So now let's talk about hypothesis and specification tests. There are three approaches available. One is the likelihood ratio test. The second one is the wall test. And the Lagrangian multiplier test, you know, the most popular tend to be this likelihood ratio test. Um, because as the name, uh, I mean, you know, the name refers that you, know, you are using the likelihood function. So that's probably the most popular one. 
And basically, in terms of intuition, it, what you are doing is you are comparing the log likelihood function of a restricted model and an unrestricted model. That's kind of similar to what you learn in uh, probably in um, econometrics one, where um, you know you were comparing nested models and you had to compare the um, Uh, the R squares of a restricted versus the unrestricted model and the, the, the function for F to test a certain uh, certain restrictions is based on the R squares of a restricted and unrestricted model. So here what we are comparing is the log likelihood function of the restricted versus the unrestricted model. So how does so how it works? So let's say that mu uh, theta hat u, so that's the unconstrained MLE or unrestricted MLE, and the restricted or constrained M, uh, MLE, the estimator, is given by theta r. So for example, you know, it could be that you are uh, testing that some parameters in the mean of the normal regression model are zero. Okay. So the likelihood ratio, what's called likelihood ratio, is just the ratio of the likelihood for the restricted and the unrestricted. So this is going to be the likelihood value for the restricted model divided by the likelihood value for, this is going to be the unrestricted model. So that's what's called the likelihood ratio. Now, under the null hypothesis, so the null hypothesis is that restrictions are valid. And the alternative is that not the null. But under the null hypothesis, so it can be shown that minus 2, the natural log of the likelihood ratio, which is equal to minus 2 LLR, minus L you had. So remember, these are the log likelihood for the restricted model. And this is the log likelihood for the unrestricted model. So it can be shown that that follows a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the number of restrictions. This is very straightforward. So basically what you do is you estimate both models and then you use the um, values of the log likelihood function, the difference. So that's minus 2, and that's supposed to follow a chi-square distribution with uh, degrees of freedom equal to the number of restrictions, and that's kind of what you use for, for testing. So for interpretation, so basically, it's going to be that the failure to reject the null this is going to provide evidence that the restrictions are valid. OK, so basically, or another way to say, so that's evidence in favor of the restricted model. And of course, rejection of the null hypothesis. It's evidence in favor of the unrestricted model. So that's evidence in favor of unrestricted model. So that's basically, it's very straightforward, and we, we, we will practice doing that. Um, so before we finish, so, I mean, you know, hopefully, you know, that gives you a, a good idea of, um, you know, the main process and the theory behind maximum likelihood estimation. But before we finish, now that you see how that works, and I know that this is the example that I've used is kind of a relatively a simple example, but that being said, it's, 
I mean, it's something that's done in practice and not, and, and not done in practice. So let's talk about, in general, about the advantages and disadvantages. of MLE, okay, or maximum likelihood estimation. So let's look at the main advantages and the main disadvantages. Advantages and disadvantages. So advantages, so this is a consistent an asymptotically efficient estimator. Uh, what's going on here? Consistent and asymptotically efficient estimator. And the other advantage is that you know, you know, you estimate the entire distribution instead of you know, only certain moments, or you know, if you use just OLS. Um, in some cases, the only thing you know that you are estimating is the mean, but here you have the entire distribution, which can be used for, for certain applications. distribution. The main the disadvantage is, is that, you know, of course, it's consistent and asymptotically efficient estimator, which means that we need a large sample. And of course, uh, what's a large sample? I mean, we have talked about that in the past. It depends on the specific estimator that you are using on the specific application. Of course, you know, it requires more information. So, the trick here is, remember, this estimator is consistent and asymptotically efficient estimator if you are estimating the right distribution, so it requires more information. More information. So you are plugging in more information. I mean, you know, you are sure that that's your probability distribution. That's what you are estimate, estimating, and then you get this consistent asymptotically efficient estimator. So remember, in the context of OLS, um, you know, for example, the property of uh, unbiasedness, um, you know, we didn't know to know anything about um, uh, heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation. Uh, even if the model is homoscedastic or heterocadastic, you still get with OLS uh, unbiased estimates of your of your data. Yes, I mean you lose efficiency, but uh, if the specification of the mean is correct, I mean you don't need this additional information. Here you need that additional information of this specific specific. You know you need all the features of the distribution to be correct for your coefficients to be consistent and asymptotically efficient. So that's kind of the, the tricky part of it. Sometimes you know, it could be more difficult. I mean, you know, if you are trying to estimate, use MLE for some uh, probability density function that it's not in the software, it might be more difficult to apply it, but I mean, it's possible with what uh, we learned today. So it's more difficult if MLE, specific MLE function is not in software. Okay, and so the tricky part too is in most cases that you're gonna get inconsistent um, estimates if the distribution selected is incorrect. So, I mean, there are some distributions that are robust, but uh, only in special cases. Oops. Uh, so, in most cases, oh, I don't know what I did. I think that I... Uh, Uh, 
See, I think somehow I change. I click something. Well, let me finish. So in most cases, since I, this is the last thing that I'm gonna say, inconsistent. If the distribution selected. Distribution selected is incorrect. Okay, so there are things to be gained, and that's kind of like a, a, I'd say that's kind of like a, a general principle in econometrics. You know, the more information that you add, if the information is correct, you're gonna get efficiency. But if the information is not correct, uh, in this case, you know, you may even lose consistency of uh, your estimates. So you have to be careful. Okay, so this is the first part, kind of like the introduction to maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the specific example in, 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 in the next class.